like to warmly welcome you all to the fourth Funding Network uh, event hosted by Creative Black Country. Today, we're looking forward to the 2022 Commonwealth Games and the cultural programme with Rachel Magson. And then we'll be exploring corporate support for the arts and culture section in the region with Kevin Rogers from Paycare. Um, firstly, I'd like to introduce Rachel, the Partnerships and Development Manager for the Cultural Programme, who has the mighty task of securing funding for this exciting celebration of creativity um, in, our, in our area. And uh, she's a very experienced arts and culture fundraiser, so I know she knows where we're all coming from. Um, so I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you and, and morning all and, and thanks for um, having me here. I'm really sorry I can't stay for the whole session, but I'm, in, I'm interviewing today for a new role to join our team. So I'm in between interviews. And I also apologize for the exercise bike and pop up child's tent in the background, but such is working from home life, isn't it? Um, that's really sweet of Yvonne to say I'm an experienced fundraiser. Sometimes I still don't consider myself a fundraiser, which is how it goes, isn't it? But um, just a little bit about me. So I've, um, been with the Commonwealth Games since July. Prior to that, I was um, head of fundraising at Birmingham Hippodrome, or eventually head of fundraising at Birmingham Hippodrome, but I had a couple of different roles there for nearly six years, um, including a year after I had my daughter. And then prior to that, I was at Pentabus Arts over in Shropshire. So I was the exec director there with a really small team working from an old Victorian schoolhouse and farm, creating new plays about the countryside. And then before that, I was at Arts Council England for six years, um, mainly working in combined arts, um, field back when it was just the West Midlands and um, so it is a little bit like death by PowerPoint again today but I hope you don't mind that I just thought it'd be good to talk you through some slides um, I'm going to talk mainly about the cultural programme but also a little bit about the learning programme of the games and then just a few other ways that you might want to connect into the games or to share with your networks I know there's quite a range of probably knowledge and experience in the room so I hope I'm not sort of you know, telling people things they already know, but it's always a good level, isn't it? Sometimes just to tell everyone the same thing at the same time. Um, so I'm just gonna remind myself how to share the screen Zoom. So here we go, this hopefully should work, but let me know if you can see it. Can you see it? Yeah? Yes, Great. Rachel. Fab, so for those who don't know, uh, in 2022, Birmingham will be hosting the 22nd Commonwealth Games, the largest event to be held in England for over 10 years. So 10 years on from uh, the Olympics in 2012. So essentially that boils down to 12 days of sport, six and a half thousand athletes and team officials, 72 Commonwealth nations and territories. There are 19 sports represented, some of which are kind of core sports and then every Commonwealth Games selects a few sports to be part of their games. We're expecting at least 1.3 million ticketed spectators to attend um, and enjoy and celebrate the sporting heights. And then as part of the bid to be the host city, it was always the intention to have a cultural festival and a learning programme. Both the cultural festival and the learning programme were unfunded, so they didn't come with any core funding attached from the core um, city partners. And we're hoping with the cultural festival to at least double the number of ticketed spectators that will be watching the sports. And of course, there will be a global broadcast audience of uh, over a billion people. So it's a really exciting moment for our city and region. Although it's called the Birmingham Commonwealth Games, um, many of the sporting venues are not in the city. So that they include Sutton Park, Cannock Chase, um, Samwell Aquatic Centre. So it really is quite a region wide um, celebration, which is brilliant. And Samuel Aquatic Centre, I can see the cranes from where I live. Um, so it's really exciting seeing it being built. So um, the Cultural Festival, um, basically our executive uh, producer, Radine Carter, joined um, back at the start of 2020 with two other producers. And effectively, they spent about nine to ten months meeting with people talking to the sector hosting a series of roundtable events on different themes um, and really just sort of listening and getting to know people and what people would want from a festival that if we if we were to have one and then I joined in July and we started to shape that into a kind of business case and a sort of um, you know business plan if you like for the festival so this is our vision really for that festival 
So it is about an arts led festival that is ambitious, that is really harnessing this once in a lifetime opportunity. We would like it to sort of positively disrupt the region's cultural sector and really inspire lasting change. It is about collaboration and it is about artists and communities coming together. And we do want it to be audacious, playful and inclusive, truly inclusive. And over six months, we hope it will entertain, engage and embrace at least 2.5 million people. And importantly, really raise Birmingham up um, out of its chip off its shoulder, as we know Birmingham and the Black Country offer are, but really putting us on a, on a global stage and having the moment that our city perhaps hasn't had in the way that Liverpool and Manchester have had with cities of culture and Commonwealth Games before. The team then from all that listening and talking kind of came up with a series of principles of how we would approach the sort of curatorial framework for the festival. So this is artistically led, it is about artists taking the lead, it is about ambition. We think there needs to be some joy. Uh, hell knows it's been a tough year for everyone in our sector. Um, and we think there do need to be some really joyful, playful moments. We want people to approach it with a spirit of generosity and we're hoping to do the same, whether that's about, um, you know, being open and honest, you know, good partnerships, um, generous with spirit, with, you know, resources, with partnerships, that it should be a creative showcase for the rich diversity of the city and region that it is about Commonwealth collaboration. So there will be some international collaborations, but primarily this is about investing in the region, that it will be inspired by and inspire the learning programme for the games, and that it will go above and beyond the social values of the games. So those are things like the greenest games ever, um, you know, around disability, local employment, those sorts of things. The team then develops um, three what they call curatorial lines, which will sort of drop away as we move towards the festival, but they were starting points for discussion. Um, and they're fairly self-explanatory, but they sort of cross over and um, you know, interact. And the image on the left is a good example, really, of how that might come to fruition in an artwork. So we've been talking to an artist called Hugh Lock, who's a British Guyanese artist. Um, and he would like to do a project called Victoria exclamation mark where the Victoria statue in the council square of Birmingham um, is sort of adorned in his own words as a kind of voodoo goddess on a sort of slave ship. So really exploring the legacy um, of the Commonwealth, the empire legacy of the Commonwealth, reflecting on the current um, sort of political context around Black Lives Matter and also stories of Birmingham, the West Midlands and how Victoria um, was a key figure in the development of our city. Um, the present moment could be anything and we want to leave some space within the festival to reflect on whatever is the current thing as we move nearer towards it because it's been such a sort of 12 to, 12 to 15 months of change. And then how, how is the festival going to manifest? So we think there will be at least 29 major commissions um, which will be direct commissions that the producing team will commission which about showcasing ambition and diversity. We're then going to run at least six open calls on specific themes and briefs, and there are three out at the moment which close next week, leading to at least 28 further commission projects of scale. We've received um, a million pounds from Spirit of 2012 for something we're calling Critical Mass. So this is a really exciting 14 month journey of genuine inclusive participation for disabled and non-disabled young people on a dance and movement programme which will see young people from all across the region, around three to 400 young people go on a journey, um, which is all about dance and movement participation, culminating in six major performance moments, two of which will be the opening and closing ceremony of the um, Commonwealth Games. We've received two million pounds of funding from Birmingham specifically, I know this is black country focus, but it's uh, there is a um, important sort of point later on, which I'll bring up, but um, this is about a grant programme of real scale for Birmingham, so £2 million to award so that every ward in the city has co-created projects between artists and communities that will form part of the festival programme. We're then looking for people to sort of turn and face the festival, so if there are things that people are already planning that they feel they would like in the festival and that align, and um, we will bring them into the festival program and they'll benefit from marketing and logoization and things like that, um, but that wouldn't be about direct funding. And then also through Spirit of 2012, they launched quite a while ago something called the Westminster Challenge Fund, 
um, and Ray Dean, our executive producer, was on the decision making panel for that. And that's led to three projects of scale at about 200k each. Um, again, all about genuine partic inclusive participation and um, bringing communities together. And I'm pleased to say one of those is in the Black Country, which is um, led by Black Country Together. So the festival, where will it manifest? What will it be? So it really will be all across the West Midlands, but we will have a specific focus on Birmingham, the Black Country, uh, where our games venues are. It is all art forms. Ray Dean often says we're not fussy. So we, we are happy to um, look at all art forms, everything from craftism to, um, you know, opera. And um, so we're just about how art reaches people um, and in a genuine way, in a representative way. It will manifest in all places and spaces and quite a lot of this outside of traditional venues. So this is about high streets, the public realm, canals, parks, community spaces. And we're really interested in anything anyone can dream up. Um, as we're the 5G test bed for the country, uh, we're very interested in digital and how we might test 5G um, capability, um, which is quite exciting. And it will be primarily free at the point of access. So we don't think there will be much that will be paid for ticketed. Where we think that will come might be through um, the alignment programme. And who is it for? So we genuinely, really, truly, truly want this to be about local and regional audiences. So people who call Birmingham the West Midlands home. And when we say that, we mean representative of the demographics of the city and region. And we think that will be 70 to 80 percent of audiences. We then hope there may be a UK wide audience that would travel. This will be, you know, 12 million pound festival of scale. So we hope some of the large scale commissions or pieces of note will be things that people would want to travel to to experience which is also about positioning Birmingham and our region as a major cultural destination. And then, of course, there will be international visitors who are perhaps here for the sport who may encounter the festival in different ways. Um, and I think important to say, as we move through the six months of the festival, there will be things that will be durational that will run through the whole festival. So, for example, a photographic exhibition, as well as things that will happen in certain moments across the fest festival, pardon me. We identified talking and listening that there are quite a few sort of cross-cutting areas and priority groups, which are, you know, up here, but, um, uh, and I'm sure you can read them, but children and young people. Um, heritage and history is really interesting. We know that the Commonwealth, um, you know, is a challenging history and heritage for many people, and we don't want to shy away from that. We're very open to honest conversations about the legacy of Commonwealth and colonialism and what our modern Commonwealth means. And we know that, um, you know, even within the Commonwealth now, there are different laws and um, attitudes which, um, you know, we want to explore and address. So we're not sort of scared of those conversations and we think heritage and history is a really interesting way of exploring that. Um, we're interested in placemaking and place shaping and play, the notion of play and how play can lead to um, communities coming together. And then a couple more priority groups there. Um, but certainly, about people that perhaps established cultural institutions don't reach as opposed to um, you know people being less engaged we think it is about that they're not being reached and those of course with commonwealth um, nations and territory roots so we're hoping that will lead to a six-month festival two and a half million audiences at least five thousand real sort of life enhancing potentially life-changing participatory experiences 550 artists and creative practitioners being invested in directly through our programme and many more um, as, a, as a sort of byproduct of our investment through um, subcontracts and freelance contracts, etc. We are hoping to run at least three sector capacity building and skills initiatives. Um, one will be around diverse leadership. One will be around the freelance sector and sort of bouncing back from COVID. And one will be linked to the Creative City grant programme with Birmingham around community leadership. And we will have um, at least 500 very specific volunteering opportunities that are linked to the cultural festival. This is the sort of timeline we're working towards. We're in the middle now of beginning to commission and sort of put out the open calls and things like that while still fundraising. So it's a bit of a, a, bit of a challenging moment for me and the team, but um, it's really exciting as we lead towards the reveal and readiness and obviously the games themselves. Um, obviously COVID has been evolving picture as it has been for many and we know it's had a really damaging impact on our sectors and communities so we're hoping that 2022 really will be you know the moment where we can welcome people back where we can get together go out go outside reconnect gather celebrate play 
and that feels with the rollout of the vaccine that that may be possible because it feels far enough away. So I think it really is um, uh, the impact of it could be even greater. Um, we're also responsible in our team for the live sites, um, which are the big screens that pop up around the games that have a sort of augmented program around them um, in terms of have a go sports, cultural provision, food and drink, etc. And it, it, it will be that many of the cultural projects that are screen based or can animate screens may also sort of pop up at live sites as well. In terms of where we are in terms of funding, um, one of the things I wanted to stress is that certainly in the first bubble, the funding that's been secured, so that's 3 million from Arts Council England, 3 million from National Lottery Heritage Fund, 2 million from Birmingham City Council and a million from Spirit of 2012. All of that funding was sort of um, strategic funding that was sort of ring fenced nominally for us to approach and respond to. So we're not necessarily taking away from the region. So this isn't coming out of regional pots, you know, away from others that otherwise would have benefited. So this is about new investment into the region. Um, so all of that first bubble has been secured um, and I'm currently working on um, around two million pounds worth of requested from sort of national trusts and foundations. So the likes of Esme Fairburn, Paul Hamlin, those sorts of funders. Um, and then we're still working on up to a million pounds worth of regional funding. Um, and that's probably been the most challenging, I would say, at the moment, just because of COVID and um, the impact of COVID and sort of um, partners like Westminster's Combined Authority, et cetera, um, you know, also having challenging settlements from government. But the baseline for me is to raise 12 million pounds um, and all of that will go into the cultural festival. If you think about that, if it was a sort of Arts Council MPO, you know, it would be a real sort of client of size. And that will all go into the six month festival. The other thing I think important thing to say is in terms of expenditure, around 70% of that 12 million is going almost directly back out into artistic heritage and community commissions. And then obviously there's um, funding for, you know, our staffing team, marketing comms, evaluation, et cetera. But it is a really large percentage that is going back out into the sector and, and, and the region. So investing back into, you know, clients and organisations and, you know, from small to large that have had a really challenging time uh, over the COVID period. I'm going to touch on this briefly, but um, I sent to Yvonne a sort of document that's got more on our theory of change, and this is sort of our legacy ambitions. And um, so we have set up a theory of change, which is around the change that we want to see for the sector and region. Um, and you can read this for yourselves here. Um, but it's about using that global platform for, for long term change around, um, you know, in government investment. How do we engage and, um, you know, develop audiences for arts and culture, etc. But the main aims of our, our theory of change are to bring back audiences following the global pandemic, to prove the value of culture and, you know, reinstating and increasing local investment in arts and culture foregrounding partnerships that connect diverse artists and diverse audiences and really promoting Birmingham and the West Midlands as an international city of creativity and a brilliant place to live, work and study. And in our theory of change, which is in more detail in the document, we, um, we outline that we will be directly responsible for the short term outcomes in our team, accountable for the medium term outcomes and then guide and inspire long term impacts. Um, obviously, all of our team, you know, the games is set up to dissolve. So um, by the end of quarter, uh, the first quarter of 2023, the games will be completely dissolved and all of our team will sort of dissolve and disappear by sort of November, December 2022. So the legacy can't live with us. It needs to be embedded out with partners in the sector. Um, so we're really open to discussing what that might mean. All of that said, and I know it's quite a lot to take in, there are lots of ways that you can engage with us and talk to us and look for opportunities that this festival will bring. So the first thing to say is we have a team of producers led by Ray Dean um, and we are uh, we did lots and lots of listening and all those roundtable events and lots of one to one meetings. We've now drawn the roundtable events to a close, but we are doing surgery still with producers. So if you do want to speak to the producers about an idea. Um, we're doing specific surgeries related to any open calls that we put out or if you've got a proposal you'd like to send or be discussed you just simply email culture at Birmingham 2022 and the team will respond. We have three open calls that are currently live and I know some of you will have seen those and um, there's a full document on our website with all of the um, commissioning opportunities and guidelines and um, there will be three more at least to follow. 
I haven't got exact timelines and pots of money sort of available today because it's still a bit of a moving feast depending on fundraising. But one of them will be focused around digital. One of them will be focused around artistic and community responses to the 19 sports that feature in the games. So um, at, at least 19 commissions um, related to each of the sports. And one is just simply called the present moment. And that will be the latest open call we put out um, in order to respond to the latest things that are happening in the world. Um, but also any gaps in the programme that we haven't been able to fill through other routes. The Creative City Grants programme that I mentioned, although that is Birmingham focused and applicants need to come from Birmingham, it is about bringing together artists with communities. So there's no reason why a black country artist or creator or heritage maker or whatever they may be, glass artist, couldn't benefit and be involved. Um, there will be more information coming out about this in spring, um, quite soon in the spring. Um, and there'll be advice surgeries, networking events uh, to network artists to potential applicants and guidance. So that's definitely an opportunity that um, is worth looking at from an artist perspective or creative perspective. If you're thinking you might have something you're already planning that might align to the programme that doesn't necessarily need funding, but you'd like it to be part of the festival, then simply come and chat to us and there'll be a process for that in due course about how you can come into the programme. And just in general, if you're not already signed up for updates from our team, um, if you follow that link, there's a, a sign up form. And then if there's any kind of e-flyers that we put out, you'll get all the information. And then these are just a couple of other ways that you can engage with the games more generally that I thought might be worth highlighting. So there's already a sort of um, marketing association branding type um, a program called United By, which is about community projects that want to be part of the games and they get to use this branding um, and be promoted by us on websites and social, et cetera, et cetera. There's full guidance and details of how to apply um, on that link there, but it's all about um, improving skills, training, volunteering, benefiting the environment, participation in sports, quite broad. So it's not culture specific, but that's another opportunity. As you may um, have established or gather, we will need more than 12 and a half thousand volunteers to help us organize, run and manage the games. And these are the sort of formal volunteering opportunities that come with the uniform and um, all of that stuff. So that's be, being led by a different um, functional area to ours. Um, but absolutely that will open up as we move through this year. And um, so there'll be a process there. And I know lots of people are excited about that. And then we will also want and have a need for volunteers for the cultural festival specifically. And again, there will be a process for that. It would be quite different from the main volunteering process, but um, watch this space and that will come out in due course, particularly um, some of the heritage projects that we're likely to commission will need heritage type volunteers. Um, but there may well be, you know, festival stewarding, all sorts of things um, that will come up. And just in terms of tickets, because people always want to know about tickets and um, tickets will um, be released again as we start moving through this year. Um, so there'll be big, you know, media announcements about that, about how you can get tickets. And because uh, people always ask, it's a bit like when you work in a theatre and people say, don't you get to see all the shows for free? We do not get any free tickets, so I can't help you there. Um, so that's the cultural programme and a couple of other sort of broader opportunities. And then I just wanted to touch on the learning programme. The learning programme um, I think it's safe to say, and we are happy to uh, say this as a games, has, has been a bit later in its development for lots of reasons, and partly because of schools have been homeschooling, et cetera, et cetera. But there will be a learning programme for the games. There's now around two million pounds that's been secured for that. Um, it's primarily about children and young people in the West Midlands. And that's really reflective of the fact we're the youngest population of any major city in Europe. And we're very reflective of the Commonwealth in that nature. And of course, athletes themselves who tend to be of a younger age profile. So essentially with the learning programme, we want to directly engage a million children and young people across the West Midlands and bring them closer to the game. So this is all about much broader than culture. This is about bringing young children and young people into the games, being able to watch and be inspired by, that they can use the games as a catalyst for learning, participation, volunteering, and lots of things around um, mental well-being, youth action and youth voice, and that we can help tackle social inequality to those young people that are furthest away from the opportunity and create pathways to bring them closer. Um, how that will sort of manifest, there'll definitely be um, a kind of offer for all schools um, and when I say schools that includes you know things like PRUs and virtual schools and so not just traditional school environments 
so this is all about classroom activities, resources and projects and um, coordinated engagement opportunities for young people with games assets, you know, teacher projects, that sort of thing. There'll be then some grassroots community youth provision, and this might include um, lots of partnerships and um, opportunities to participate, but also um, will include a series of targeted projects. So that's about um, trying to reach children and young people at the, the, the real edges, the real fringes. So um, one that we've already managed to um, uh, sort of secure due to some investment from the Commonwealth Sports Federation is um, a partnership with Birmingham Children's Trust which is the care service provider for children in care in Birmingham, for example. So they will sort of do their own games. There'll be um, apprenticeship opportunities, youth opportunities, volunteering opportunities, etc. So really children and people who otherwise the games may sort of pass by. And then there'll be lots of opportunities for young people to be volunteers, apprentices, to create digital content, to be um, young presenters, that sort of thing. And this, this will wrap around all the broader games opportunities like the mascot and those sorts of opportunities. So getting the mascot in your school and that sort of stuff. And this is just a diagram which is um, includes sort of some of the things I've talked about. So the what was called Creative Communities that's now the City Grants Programme, you know, the Mass Cast, um, Critical Mass Programme, the Cultural Festival, tickets, life sites, mascot sport. And it's all about the routes into the the sort of different routes in for children and people about how it gets them closer to the heart of the games and help us deliver on our um promise that this will be a games for everyone and um, so there'll be a lot more on the learning program as we move towards the autumn and it will probably formally launch in the autumn but it may well be that there are opportunities for children and people that you work with that you will want to um you know keep abreast of as well as some potential funding opportunities i just don't know as much about those yet in terms of how the programme may manifest and sort of be allocated in terms of the funding that we have. That was a real whiz through, but I hope that was helpful and I'm really happy to take any questions you may have. If I don't know the answer, I will try and find it out. So I'm gonna stop this now and stop sharing. So you always just feel like you're talking in a void when you're doing these <laughs> virtual presentations, but. That was brilliant. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for that whistle stop tour and so much um, kind of, you know, uh, love for you going out here for your 12 million pounds yeah. <laughs> target. Um, we have had a couple of questions. Okay. But one one um, came in actually beforehand. So I'd like to ask, uh, I know Heather Wasty had a question and then also we've got a question from um, from Carolyn as well, from Carolyn uh, at BCLM. So um, Heather, do you want to ask your question first? Uh, yes, okay, thank you. Um, it's partly been answered through the presentation, but um, I'm from Alarum Productions and we are a, a theatre company. Um, we do community projects, we research um, on the heritage side. Um, and we were very excited when we saw the, the word canals yeah. in, the, uh, in the brief, because um, that, that is where we focus our energies, uh, canals and women and heritage mainly. Um, and we did look at applying, but didn't feel that the emphasis on nature wasn't really for us. Okay. Um, and also um, it, the reach of the project was quite big. Um, it, and we imagined that the sort of project we could offer just wouldn't fit that brief. So my question was, um, what other opportunities are there? And I can see from the next set of calls that we probably don't fit into that either. But you did emphasise heritage. Yeah. Um, so, and and our, our audiences tend to be mainly older people. Um, and I haven't actually seen much mention of them. So I'm just interested to find out how we can we can benefit we we do have a um we have started thinking about a project um collaborating with a, another organization we're very excited about that um but we don't it's, it's knowing what the next steps are really 
Yeah, sure. So this, uh, thanks, Heather, and, and thanks for the question. Um, so there's a couple of things, really. So one of the things I forgot to say that I meant to say, so although we've secured three million from Arts Council and three million from National Lottery Heritage Fund, I know that sounds like an awful lot of money, and it is an awful lot of money, and I've never dealt in millions before. So you sort of have to make this leap in your head, but then go, it's, it's scale, but the process is sort of similar. Um, what we've agreed with both Arts Council and National Lottery Heritage Fund, because I know this sounds really sim silly and ridiculous to say, but three million will only stretch so far for each of those funders. So what we've agreed with both of those funders is through the discussions that we're having with, um, you know, potential commission projects and the open calls and everything else. If there are projects above and beyond that, that um, we, we would like to support and we feel have merit and we would love to welcome into the festival, but we just can't fund them out of the core funding that we already have. That um, Arts Council and Heritage Lottery are happy to welcome applications into their sort of usual grant scheme, so like project grants with Arts Council England and heritage equivalents with heritage. Um, and what we're doing with both funders is sort of keeping them abreast of conversations that we're having. And if something is going to be submitted directly, so if you were to want to say, create your own heritage application to go through their normal grant system, and you perhaps would meet with our producers, discuss the project with them. And if it was something we were sort of keen to support, but couldn't commission it directly, we can provide a kind of letter of support and let, let the organization, uh, the funder know that we're interested, but it's not within the 3 million that they've already given us. So that's sort of a process that we're working to with both those two funders in particular. So that may be one route that you could book a producer surgery, discuss your ideas and see if you might want to develop your own direct application in order as a route to get it funded. Probably the other one, because I think you're right, the other open calls that are coming up sound that they're not quite, quite the right fit for you and perhaps the scale was too big. Um, if you were interested in sort of the, you know, Birmingham to Black Country Canal Network, for example, and working with some communities in Birmingham, then it may be you could look at the uh, Creative City Grants Programme once that launches, because there's no reason that couldn't be canal based, you know, we're, it's very open sort of framework, that will be a very open framework. Um, so I think those for that particular idea, probably the, the two that spring to mind, but I'd, I'd probably just welcome you to, to drop some an email and some thoughts to the producers and see if you can get a chat with them to see how it might fit and, and explore other opportunities. Um, the other, other thing I was going to mention, um, which won't be as relevant for you, I don't think, Heather, but if there's anyone that's um, sort of music focused, um, we've had a, a meeting with the PRS Foundation and they're unlikely to fund us directly, but they're very happy to welcome applications to their usual funding strands. So there's a, one for individuals, one for organisations, and they'll soon be launching their um, new music bi bi biennial sort of application round. Um, and again, if, if we provide a letter of support, they would see sort of Birmingham 2022 as a kind of strategic priority in this next sort of year and a half. So it may be that just heightened your sort of chance of success, given that it's part of the this platform if you like does Thank that you. does that help it, yeah it does yes actually i'm a member of prs we include music yeah so it could be you know so there's a yeah that that's given yeah that's given me um three options so that's yeah. that's really helpful thank and you i suppose the, the more downside of it to say is that although 12 million is a lot of money it's not going to fund every great idea and every brilliant thing that people are bringing to us so we know that we're not going to be able to fund everything directly through the funding that sort of we're raising we think there will be some other routes like those I've just mentioned but again even those obviously competitive post-covid you know demand so we think there will be some ideas that are brilliant that we're just not going to be able to sort of manifest um but we're really open to having conversations and that hasn't stopped you know the producers are still doing these surgery slots and still looking at proposals and ideas Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Heather. So I think that's also helped probably some other people on the call as well um, who might be in, in a similar situation. Uh, so I just want to ask Carolyn um, from BCLM if you want to ask your question that I know is in the chat as well. Yeah, thanks, Yvonne. Um, I'm glad you can hear me now. I've got diggers going on outside the window at the museum. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> this morning, but it's quiet for the moment. Um, yeah, we're obviously um, we're delighted to be part of the current open call that's out for trans. So we're we're partnering with that. So it'd be great to see what kind of response um, you get through to, to, to that call. Um, this is really just a practical question on you know you referred to the six month festival and just wondering about the time frame on that. Yes, is that six months? Say that, didn't I? The, 
<laughs> or just is it start from the start of the, of the games themselves or is it starting sooner no kind of, sorry I totally that was probably in my notes somewhere and I forgot so I missed our, it, sorry. <laughs> our festival will launch on the 14th of March 2022 which is Commonwealth Day it's a, a day that moves around so it will launch in in March and then I'm going to say a really strange thing, which is we haven't actually decided when it's going to stop yet. Um, we'd nominally always said it would go into September, um, but I think we're waiting. Basically, my baseline fundraising target is 12 million, but there's an ambition for me to raise more, you know. <laughs> uh, so I think I think when we end, we'll relate to um, how much we raise, whether we can have a real big finish or whether it's better to sort of bring forward the closure to almost align with the closing ceremony, which would be sort of and the late sort of bank holiday August sort of time. So it, it's March to September loosely, but it may end in August. But I think we'll make a decision on that over the next few months, probably by the end of the summer. And um, so really it, it will come quite in advance of the games and then wrap around the games. Um, and obviously within the games, um, we'll have the opening and closing ceremonies, which will be huge cultural events in their own rights. Um, and, and, and then, you know, there's sort of just layers and layers, really. Um, the other thing I did forget to say that I meant to say at the start, the start um, this is the first games where all the sort of cultural assets, if we can call them that, are under one, what we call functional areas, sort of view department. So Martin Green, who's our chief cultural officer, um, Martin um, was heavily involved with um, 2012, and some of you may uh, have heard of him or know his sort of biog. Um, so the opening and closing ceremonies, what's called sports presentation, which is the sort of look and feel of the sport as you're sort of waiting for it to start, what's on the screens, what the music is, what the presenters do, all that side of things. The cultural festival, the learning programme, and the, what's called the Queen's Baton Relay. And the Queen's Baton Relay is the sort of Commonwealth equivalent of the torch. So it's a baton that travels around the Commonwealth with a message from the Queen. And it's all about sort of, um, you know, spirit of the city, the voice of the city, traveling around the Commonwealth. So all of those creative assets um, and the medal design, sorry. So the medal design and the box the medal goes in and the ribbon of the medal, all this stuff all of that sits within our sort of department. So there's a lot of sort of cross fertilization at the moment going on about, so for example, Ray Dean, who's our executive producer, has led on the medal design process with BCU and their School of Jewelry, for example. So it's been like an open competition to design the medal, which again, hasn't really been done before. Usually they just pick an artist and they design it. Um, so that's really exciting as well, that it's sort of quite organic and collaborative across that. Brilliant, thanks Rachel. I've just also can see um, another question around the best email that address that people can use if they want to submit a proposal. Um, yeah. So it probably is just that culture app, that central one. Um, I'm very happy to share some of our producers emails directly with Yvonne if you want to sort of directly drop a line. Um, but the culture app box is sort of monitored by our administrator. And so if you've got any questions or proposals or ideas, he will sort of intercept those and filter them off. But I, I'm very happy to share the direct um, right, emails right. as well. And you've, you've got mine. So if there's any ever a question, you can always drop me a note as well. And is so, and, and is that how you set up a surgery as well? If you wanted yes. to speak to someone, you yeah. go through it. That's the main email for anybody to contact. Yes, yeah, so I think if you're interested in a surgery or you'd like to send through like a one page or a two page or whatever you've got, um, obviously you could reference there was, there was this session um, and then outline it a little bit and then that will get picked up um, and looked at by the team. And, and then our administrator will chat to the producers and see what the response should be. Sometimes you might just get a holding response that sort of says, you know, da, 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 we can do this, we can do that, we can do this, do look at the website, et cetera. But if you're a bit more pointed about what you'd like, I'm sure that will get sort of picked up. Brilliant, thank you. And so, um, uh, I've got a question about in terms of program alignment. Who would it be? Is that still the same per still still the same email address? Whether it's alignment or surgery or yeah. So the program alignment. We're just sort of working through actually how that might work. We've recently been joined by a couple of, of new producers, and um, because we started with just like a team of three, but eventually our team will be a team of about fifteen that will deliver this festival, which still isn't that many people when you think it's twelve million pounds, <laughs> but. Um, so we've been joined by two new producers and Claire, one of those producers is beginning to think more about the programme alignment and how that will work. 
there will be a sort of process at some point of saying yes I'd like to do this and here's my program and how do I get the logo and all that stuff but for now if it's just a broader I think we're interested in that here's what we're thinking of doing yeah just put it through and we'll um uh, we'll pick that up and, and let you know that's brilliant now I don't know whether I can't see everybody I don't know whether there's any well, maybe one more question if anybody had one up but I know that then we need to let Rachel go <laughs> all right. and then um, I was just going to say I'm aware I have mentioned Birmingham quite a bit um just because some you know but I think the black country is a really important area for us you know we know it's a really um diverse and exciting part of our region um, and we really do see that the black country has another priority um, we're currently talking to uh, the national lottery community fund which are a funder that haven't really sort of come to the table yet in terms of uh, the sort of central funding that we've received and i know that um you know again parts of the black country are a priority for them so again, we're sort of plugging ahead, hoping to make a central application to them. But again, I think if anyone was thinking of approaching them directly, again, perhaps get in touch with us and see if we can provide a letter of support and things like that. Because I think it will probably just, I think what we can offer is a sort of leverage and sort of, um, you know, that just having that letter yeah. of support signed by Martin is, yeah. is just, um, you know, it just heightens that you know, we, we, va we value and um, yeah. want to include the program or project or whatever it is that you're working on. But, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, I know it sounds ridiculous because it's 12 million plans, but it is only going to stretch so far across the whole region. So yeah. if there are other opportunities, um, sort of do bring those to us as well. Um, right. and, and I suppose the only other thing I was going to say was, um, uh, you know there will be a lot more coming out from our team over the next sort of five to six months in terms of you know the creative city grants program will launch and that will have it you know its own sort of criteria and um, framework and all sorts of advice surgeries and things like that so this is sort of where we are currently but i think there will be a lot more flowing more publicly you know in due course um over the next sort of four to six months brilliant so exciting I'm excited anyway, I'm over excited. Um, there's just a quick question from Janine about um, the 72 participating countries. That's more than the Commonwealth countries. Yes, um, um, so it's it's countries and territories and territories. Okay, right. So, um, but yes, I can send that list if that's helpful. Okay, great. Um, when I first started, I wrote them all out on a big piece of paper, but uh, I'm not, we, in the early days of lockdown, you know, and all starting virtually, and it's quite hard, isn't it, to build relationships virtually when you're in a new organisation. We had a quiz on a Friday, but there was a whole Commonwealth section that included flags and all sorts, and I never scored well on that. <laughs> I need to get a jigsaw or a tea towel or something. But yes, absolutely, yeah. I can send that through. And the yeah, sports, absolutely. if people are interested, because every Commonwealth yeah. Games has its own collection of sports. Yes. Uh, and there's just... Um... A question about the that uh, Janine's asking about something specific about the International Festival of Glass, and it's got a theme of East Asian glass, and if that's relevant. But I'm guessing Janine, it's best for you to kind of contact the team. Is that right, Rachel? And and yeah. have a conversation. Yeah, no, that would be good. And I think um, uh, I think it's if it's not a common if it's not a Commonwealth country, as it were, or territory. I think it would be of less interest in many respects but I think if you if it's it's about Birmingham and the black country and you think there's a way it can align or or make sense within the framework that I've described then then yes I would get in touch for a conversation okay. um just yes, last I, last question about does the website include all the sites for the games I think it does but if it doesn't there's a couple of slides I have on things like that it's just always difficult okay. to know what to include I know yes. it's good to tell you um but yeah and um the actual logo for Birmingham 22, that sort of angular logo, that sort of connects the dots of where all yes, the venues yes. are. And um, that's how it was designed, you know, logo designers love that stuff, don't they? Um, so yeah, so if I do the nations and territories, uh, I, I've got to write down, otherwise I forget, uh, the locations and the, was that it? And then just some contact yes, details. Yes. That's brilliant, thank you so much rachel um quite welcome i hope that was in some way useful um 
uh, to everybody. Yeah. And absolutely, um, absolutely. Thank you uh, so much. So you go off and do your um, yeah, sorry, interviews. <laughs> And what I think we'll do, it's 10 to uh, now. So um, let's take a five minute comfort break because we're going to switch subjects totally and talk about corporate support. So if we can be back at about five to, that will be fabulous. And thank Thanks you again, fun. Rachel. Thank, thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. So we're going to kind of shift focus um, a little bit now and... Uh, I'm going to, we're going to talk about corporate support for arts and culture, which is a quite an interesting topic, I think, uh, for us as uh, in the arts and culture sector and um, as thinking about fundraising. Um, I'd like to welcome um, Kevin Rogers here, uh, who's come to speak to us today. And he's the Chief Executive of Paycare Limited in Wolverhampton. So um, thanks for joining us, uh, Kevin, and coming to give us your insights. Um, so if it's OK with you, I'd like to hand over. Thanks, Yvonne. Delighted to be here. So welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Kevin Rogers, as Yvonne said. I'm, I've been the chief exec now of uh, Paycare um, now for eight years. Um, I'm also a trustee of the Wolverhampton Wanderers Foundation and also a trustee of Wolverhampton LGBT+. Um, I'm an accountant by profession, so, so please don't throw anything at the screens. These are expenses, pieces of kit, and, and you, you'll only regret it afterwards. And I'll try, I'll absolutely try not, not to be too boring. So, so if I could have the, the slides up, please. So who, who are Paycare? Um, Paycare, we, we've we probably now one of Wolverhampton's oldest businesses. Um, we were formed in 1874 by our community. Um, we, we, we were formed um, to provide health care for ordinary work, working people. Um, way before the, the, the formation of the NHS, obviously normal working people could not afford healthcare. So that's our purpose. It was formed by the community for the community. We're based in a lovely Georgian street in Wolverhampton and a lovely cobbled street um, uh, called George Street. We, we still do now what we did nearly 150 years ago, we focus on health and well-being of people. And, and that takes a number of um, routes, focusing on physical health and well-being, but more and more focusing on, on mental health and, and well-being. Um, although we're, we're, we're a little old Wolverhampton company, we have 40,000 policyholders based all across the country. And we deal with around 800 businesses um, lots of them in the Black Country, in Birmingham, the West Midlands, the Potteries, but also across, across the UK. Um, really, really important to us is that we are a not-for-profit company. So don't, we don't have shareholders. We don't have highly paid directors. Um, we are solely here for our policyholders. But also we, we talk about, we have three, three really important stakeholders. Our policyholders, first and foremost, that's the only reason I'm employed. That's the only reason all this, the people at Paycare are employed for the benefit of our policyholders. But also for our people, people talk, many, you know, many people, many organizations talk about people are the most important asset to the business. What a horrible phrase, asset. People are the business. So, you know, our people make pay care what it is. So we, our people are really important to us, but equally as important as a not-for-profit is our community. After all, we were founded out of the community. So we have to give back to the community. And as, as a not-for-profit, this is a discussion we often have at, at board, how do we measure our profitability? How successful are we? Well, to my mind, how can we give back as much as we possibly can to our community. And to date, we, we've donated 
close to three million pounds back to various projects in our community. But what does corporate social responsibility mean, mean to us? Yeah, first of all, it means giving back to our community and that can take many, many forms and I'll, I'll come to the ways in which, which we really think a bit left field about how, how we do that yet there's the three million pounds that, that we're fortunate enough to be able to give back but there are many other ways it also means improving the well-being of people so any kind of corporate social project that we invest in it has to be for the well-being of of people so you, you'll see later on that we we support many many different projects um, but at the heart of them is the well-being of people, the well-being of the, of the community. It also means developing our people because we see it as a, as a fantastic opportunity for our people to support the community, for developing their skills, they're developing their skill sets outside of life in pay care, outside of life of George Street. So it's a way that they can develop their skills, but also a way in which the organisations that we can support can share the skills that they have. Lots of the organisations that we support can't afford a marketing team, can't afford a HR team, can't afford a finance team, can't afford lots of skill sets. We have those skill sets in the business. So why don't we share them? And that's exactly what we look to do. As an accountant, and I'm going to come on to the boring bit here, and it's a horrible thing to have to say, but it, but it is absolutely true, there has to be a payback for many corporates. What's the payback for me? You know, I like to think I'm a nice accountant, but there's lots of horrible accountants there that if, if somebody goes to the finance manager, the finance director, and says, I want to invest in this project, they will say, what's the payback? Where, where, what's in it for me as an organization? And so part of that is to raise the brand awareness of, of the organization. And it's really important to recognize that that is very, very difficult to quantify. It, it's almost impossible to quantify a lot of the times. So you, you really have to work at putting together a proposition for the organization that you, you're looking to work with. So how, how do we live? and breathe CSR. As I said, we make the donations, we make numerous sponsorships across the country, not only in the Black Country and the West Midlands, but all across the country. Um, we have volunteering days. And again, this is how we can share and our skill sets with, with, the, the, with the community. And that can take any format. That can be sharing skills, but it can also be decorating offices. We, we, we had a great fun volunteering day at Bilston Town Football Club when we replaced all the paving around the ground. Great, great team building. And again, that's something that, that you can offer organisations that you're looking funding from. One of the, the, the most... This is really close to our heart and really something we, we're very proud of. Who, whoever built Pay Care House, and we've been in there since 1984 now, had got delusions of grandeur because Pay Care were never going to be as big as to occupy a, a four storey office block. So it would have been great if we could, but that was really unlikely. So typically, what we have done, we have always occupied two floors on, on, in Pay Care House. The other two we've rented out to tenants on a normal lease basis. When one of our tenants decided that they, they didn't need the office space any longer, we were left with 3,000 square feet of office space. So we, we think, what can we do with this? What can we do with 3,500 square feet of office space that's got five or six separate office units in it? So we thought, well, rather than us going down the traditional route of leasing it out again and getting the, the rental income, which we would then pass on to the community. Let's cut the landlord out. Let's offer those five 
units in that three and a half thousand square feet of office space to charities, to, to social enterprises, rent free. Because that's really valuable to them. That, and again, that's an asset that we can share with the community. So rather than those enterprises having to pay rent and giving it to the landlords, they spend it at the front end. So that's another way we, we, we can offer back to the community. We share skills, as I've, I've said before. We, we have a, a fantastic scheme called Pay Care Giving. So we give each of our employees every year 250 pounds. Now we could have given that 250 pounds to a charity, to a social enterprise as funding. But what we said to our people was, we're gonna give you 250 pounds, but we want you to grow it. Grow it for a, for a project close to your heart. So generally that 250 pounds is grown between to 750 to a thousand pounds. So it, it again, it engages with, with our people, but it means that we can give more back to our community. So what do we do? I think you have to press the button on it. I, I feel like Jonathan Van Tam now. Can, can, next slide, please. So these are just a snapshot of the organizations that, that we have supported and I'll talk through a few of them. So we, we've been supporters of Wolverhampton Wondrous Foundation now for 25 years and that is ongoing support. Now that's not for the benefit of the football club, that's for the foundation, that's for the community. We, we sponsor the, 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 the helpline at um, the, the Haven Refuge. We, we, were, we stepped in to support the Lighthouse uh, Media Centre um, with, with a significant grant and, and ongoing financial support. We're delighted to now support the, the Creative Connections Commission with, with Black Country, uh, Creative Black Country. Um, one, one of the, the, the first occupants of the, the free rental office space was, was Sickle Cell Thalassemia Project. That saved them £30,000 a year. That's £30,000 that they can invest at the front end, not giving it back to landlords. From, from um, an arts point of view, we sponsored Natalie Cutler's uh, uh, short movie, Married to the Game, which focused on improving the lives of, of young Indian girls in, in, in rural India. We, we were really pleased to, to support Kicksters um, in, in their community arts project. Um, we were found approach uh, patrons of, of the Way Youth Zone. And again, what really attracted us to that was it was a whole community experience for, for young people, not just about playing five or six football, but about art, about music, really giving young people the opportunity to experience things that, that they would not normally be able to do in their normal lives. Um, Base 25, we do an amazing job about her mental health support, about gang culture support in, in Wolverhampton. So our guys went in there and, and they painted the whole office block. Again, it, it, it helped Base 25, but what it gave was our people fantastic awareness of the issues within our community. As I said, we, we, we spread far and wide. So we, uh, Claremont Colts are, are based up in, in Lanarkshire. Um, it's, it's a disabled football team that we we're absolutely with, with with learning difficulties so we're delighted to be able to support that some of the things that I, i've missed off we we are we're really proud to to support lots of initiatives with with the grand theater and what one of one of the, the best evenings i've spent in recent years and we we begin to appreciate all these evenings out now don't, that we can have was being able to support the people's orchestra in, in west bromwich what a fantastic evening that was to see over 40 people absolutely brought back into playing musical instruments and playing together as an orchestra. Something that they, they, you know, they learned at school. But it, you know, we, we, we very often focus on, on back to netball. 
that's great if you're if you're into sport and you're into netball. But what if you're a musician? What what do you where's the route back into playing your clarinet, playing your trombone? So to be able to support that was 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 just fantastic and and, and really really proud that we could do that. So I, I'm, I'm not professing to be an expert in this. We 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 do what we think is right, what we think helps our community. Um, so what will be my, my, my top tips? So next slide, please. I think we got one, one before that, I think. Yeah. It's really, if, if you're talking to commercial organizations, it's so important to really clearly be able to articulate what's your purpose. And, and that's, 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 that's not a flippant comment. But very often we, we're so caught up in our day to day of what we're doing, we forget what we're really here for. So really, really clearly define what your purpose as, a, as, a, as an organization is. It, it's absolutely critical that the organizations that you're looking to work with, your values are the same because, because if they're not, they're just gonna lead to frustration and the partnership just just won't work so understand your values understand their values as well that are they really aligned to yours and make the proposition you you're giving to that organization really really easy just hand it on a plate for them commercial organizations like to have it made simple for them they don't like to do lots of work around it so get your proposition clear, hand it on a plate, say, this is it. This is what we're going to do. This is what's in it for you. This is what's in it for us. Absolutely don't expect quick wins. This, this is a long-term project and an ongoing project. So if, you, if you're looking for something that's going to give you a quick return in months, it, it, it's, it's really, really not. You'll be lucky if it happens. You've really got to work at it. And again, get your proposition really clearly defined. What can I offer the organization? Think about some of the things I've talked about, what, what we look to offer our people. What, and, and again, think left field, because very often you will, you will undervalue what you can offer, what your proposition is to, to the organization that you're looking to support. And going on from that, don't expect quick wins, Build relationships. Again, think think left field. Think outside of your current networking. What other opportunities are there out there that, that I can start to engage with and build those relationships? And you know, I hate cliches, and I, you know, I don't really want to sound like David Brent, but people people deal with people, don't they? And, and you know, you've got to have that 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 engagement. With, with the people that you're dealing with. And again, that's very much aligning your values, but build those long-term relationships. Don't look for quick wins, keep working at it. Next slide, please. Start small. Don't expect massive wins, start small. And that over time will, will grow. Look, at, look upon it as not a, a, a six month time frame, a 12 month frame, two year frame. We always look whenever we, we go into any kind of partnership, this is a long term thing. This is a minimum of three years that, that we're going to start to see any kind of tangible returns for it. And very often the organizations that we work with want that stability of support. However small it is, however big it is, the certainty that you can give over a longer period is, is absolutely vital. Don't think of it as grant funding. This is definitely not grant funding. This is an ongoing revenue stream that, that you're working at. It really, really is. And they can be lots of small little revenue streams. Don't rely on that big hit. That's not sustainable. It will fail. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Tell people what you're doing. Again, think outside the box. How do I tell people what I'm doing to really bring people into it? 
spark that interest from people that aren't in your normal sphere. Network, network, network. It's about building relationships. Get out there, work at it, talk to people, tell them what you do, tell them what your purpose is, tell them what's in it for them. Just And don't expect quick wins. And think outside the box. You know, as I said before, I'm really proud of, really, really proud of what we did with the office space. Because I don't know anyone in, in Wolverhampton, in the Black Country, that do what we do. And that has changed the, the, the experiences, the ability to deliver services for five organisations in Pay Care House. What else can we do? What else can we do? And again, it never stops. So always think outside the box. Next slide, please. So as, as this is arts and cultures, I thought I'd try to align some kind of arts and culture. So in, in line with the, 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 the Oscars, we've got Kevin's Golden Raspberries. So these are the top pitfalls in, in, in my opinion. Don't overpromise. Honestly, do not overpromise because it's better to underpromise and to overdeliver than, than say we're going to do all this for you and then then absolutely fail. Don't take the money and run. This is these are long-term relationships that you continually need to work at. So we have had experiences where we have given organizations considerable amounts of money. They have taken the money and they have not engaged with us in the past. Come the end of that two to three year partnership, we look at it and say, what did they promise that they would deliver for us? What did they promise that they would give the engagement to our people for? Have they spoken to us in that two to three year period? And if they're not, they haven't, then we, you know, there will always be somebody else that we can help. So you honestly have to really, really work at it. And again, don't expect immediate run results. It's, it's just not, not going to happen. And I guess the, the, the biggest message I can give out there is never, never forget your values. Don't compromise on your values. Because if your values aren't aligned with, with, with your partners, it's going to be a horrible relationship. And, and, and you're not going to enjoy it. They're not going to enjoy it. Um, so... Always stick to your values, always enjoy it. That's me. And that's what we do. And, and as an organisation, we are really, really proud of what we do for the community. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kevin, um, for giving us um, your insight, uh, because I think there is a lot um, for us as a sector in arts and creativity sector to kind of learn from other sectors and see how we can work together and I just wanted to say as well to to everyone here that um Kevin's very supportive in trying to get our two sectors to work together the business sector and the art sector so um we what we'd quite like to do um is um who's going to some uh, breakout rooms and consider what the possibilities might be um, for us going forward. Um, so um, we've got um, four questions, really, that just, just to have a discussion about. Um, we're going to um, put um, one of us in each room. We're going to go into four rooms. So there'll be me, uh, Kevin, Sajida or Rosalind in a room with you to try and keep you on track because I know it's quite hard. Um, we're going to have, I think we could actually do 20 minutes, Rosalind, if that's okay. Um, and the four questions are, but we'll put them, we'll put it in the chat and and also our, um, we, we know what the questions are. But it, um, the first question is, you know, would you, would you or your organisation consider this type of uh, funding strand or do you already do it? Have you already had experience of it? Um, 
And what support do you think you would need to access this type of funding to think along these routes? What support would you need? Um, how can the creative and cultural sector um, improve communication with the business sector in the region? And also, how, and, and generally, how could the two sectors work together more? And what are the possibilities for the region? So, um, Rosalind's put those lovely uh, questions in the chat. Thank you very much. And um, so we'll we'll go off into our into our rooms, have a little chat, and then we'll come back and feed back. It would be brilliant if the person that feeds back isn't the person who's keeping you on track, just so that we kind of hear some different voices and different perspectives um, today. So so I'll, I'll hand over to you, Rosalind, if you could. Um, just assign us our rooms, please. Thank you. So um, as Yvonne said, 20 minutes. So we'll reconvene at 20, 20 to 12 and I'll open the rooms now. Welcome back everybody. That still seems to go really quick to me. Yeah. <laughs> Where does 20 minutes go? <laughs> uh. Have we got everybody back? I think the last 12 months has seemed like a lot longer than 12 months. <laughs> it has in some ways, and in other ways it's gone really quick, hasn't it? I don't, it's like the days go slowly and the weeks go quickly or something. I don't, I can't quite work out time at the moment. It's, it's a bit strange. So let's have um, a little bit of feedback from the discussions then. So, um, Sajida, shall we start with your group? And I don't know who I can't. I don't know who was in your group and who would like to feed back. Alex, because he had a pen in his hand, so he got volunteered. Um, I've learned never to bring a pen again. <laughs> we um, started off with question one, um, and. There seemed to be sort of a question around awareness, so um, we didn't really know how this kind of um, funding worked, and a bit more awareness around that would be helpful. Um, and also about how it's how it's measured, I guess, so it won't be in monetary terms. It's more about investing in people, and it's hard to express those benefits um, in terms other than you know money. Uh, question two, um, it would be useful to have a list of the organisations that have a CSR policy um, and then the methods of applying for that. Uh, so for example, some will, some will ask for formal applications and others it's just a letter that you write in. Um, and then this thing about it becoming a very sort of long-term relationship felt like it was a big sort of onerous thing and that would be difficult to maintain. Um, and obviously some companies have a CSR policy and some don't, so how do we assess that? And then where do you start building that relationship? Uh, the communication question, um, we thought that was really important actually that the, the two sort of sectors talk to one another. Um, it kind of depends on what the businesses are willing to support uh, and again if it's not been advertised and how do we know what we're looking for what's the criteria we thought as well that this actual meeting that we're having now would be a really useful starting point uh, of sort of different organizations connecting um, and then we can sort of start asking questions about how we access funding in that way and we thought as well the chamber of commerce could be quite helpful if they've already had experience in this world, can they share some learning? Uh, and also we mentioned the Hippodrome and the Grand Theatres, you know, being quite successful in the past. Is there any key learning that they would be willing to share? Um, <laughs> and then uh, just thinking about how you sort of learn about your own benefits, you know, of, of what, you're, what you're delivering. Is there some, some sort of self-assessment that you can do um, or is there a list of benefits that you could draw up and then how do you communicate it? That kind of around making your, make, presenting your best case, I suppose, yeah. to, to, yeah, okay. I think that would be, um, 
that would be useful. Great. Thank is that is that is that um, all your points, Alex? Thank you so much. That's that's really good. Um, and uh, Kevin, shall we do your um, group? I don't know who's in your group. Sajidi will testify to this. I'm not very structured. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, 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 we kind of, the, the 20 minutes just went like really, really fast. So I don't Have know you not answered any of the questions, Kevin? Is that what you're no. saying? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm waffling here. <laughs> I'm not doing it very successfully. Would any of my group like, <laughs> like to, to, to get me out of yeah. this hole? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we just had a very generic um, conversation, but some of the key things that we, we, we said was that corporate relationships also in, enrich staff within the organisations and they bring back new growth points or values and understanding about what the benefits of these different organisations within their community are. And that even if you're a small organisation, don't undervalue you what you do because there's ways that you can engage with a corporate person that might not necessarily be monetary it could be skills development one-off activities so that that the relationships are there they might be time limited they don't have to be a, a massive amount and go on for years and years and years um they could just be when that organization needs them the most um what else did we say we also said think about the reasons behind your approach and why you're going to that organization what are the mutual wins how do you share the same values could you go with a question first um around a common theme that you share and ask for advice and open the door that way but it's really important that you do your homework on the the, the corporate partner that you want to engage with and pick the right person um to, to speak to because if you don't and you haven't done your research and you you start fumbling over any of their questions back of how how can you connect with them then it creates additional barriers rather than removing them um i don't know whether any of our group have any other comments that they want to share as well i think you summed that up rather beautifully actually <laughs> even, even without a pen in your hand <laughs> i had a pencil oh uh, it's the people with the tools that are, that are feeding <laughs> back today <laughs> With people who've come prepared. Um, yeah, just one thing, don't think of the barriers, think of the opportunities. Mm. Yeah. Good one, Kevin. Um, Rosalind, do you want to, uh, I don't know who was in your group and who had tools. I am speaking on behalf of the group, <laughs> um, but I'm just going to say that Catherine, Ben, Carolyn, Julie or Bill, please feel free to interject if you feel I've missed anything. Um, so for the first question, we kind of just discussed what everybody, what all well, their organisation and what sort of support they already received. So we had a real mixture. We obviously we had a local authority um, uh, and a charity and an MPO, and then um, uh, you know a kind of more community group as well and trusts. So um, there was a real mixture there on on kind of whether people whether they are already uh, looking into fund uh, this type of funding strand or if it's something that they could. They're the groups who they work with would benefit from this type of thing. So that was a real mixture um, for question one. In question two, uh, what support would they need help uh, to access this type of funding? This um, uh, it was discussed that it'd be interested in they'd be interested in knowing what the organ what the company um, values are and how those would align. Um, you know, with their values as a, as a kind of creative or cultural organization. They said that would be kind of really key, needing to know what those value alignments would be. Um, and uh, it was commented about this, uh, one person felt it was interesting how the Commonwealth um, program, how they're having surgeries to see if ideas align. And they think that this would actually be helpful as well if obviously corporate uh, organizations are able to maybe do that in some way. Um, so then you can, 
uh, obviously have those discussions first and kind of see where, where your values are together. Um, and Catherine, I hope you don't mind me saying uh, that you said as uh, Wolverhampton City Council that you'd be happy to kind of share information around this um, and that local authorities would be happy to, to get more involved in that sort of thing and helping kind of groups access this type of information. Um, and Carolyn uh, added that there are no hard and fast rules um, when it comes to kind of making these, uh, you know, finding out more about corporate support and just getting to know people. Don't be scared of these conversations. We're all people at the end of the day. Just go out there and try and make connections and, and have chats with people. Um, the question three, um, we discussed just building on the idea that creative and cultural activities can be good for businesses, you know, that's, they don't need to be separate they can kind of work off each other um, build that together um, bring bring people into these spaces uh, and do things and for question four um, it would be so how can the two sectors work together what are the possibilities for the region um well we kind of felt that was touched on a bit with question three but it's the mutual benefits of working together um, culture has it's obviously been highlighted in the past year um, how important cultural and creative activity is um, so it's kind of don't lose that and somehow build build more relationships and and just kind of uh, show how everyone can can benefit from that um, and just building partnerships be in communication and partnerships with people and understanding community cohesion as well um, and coming out of lockdown um, obviously this is a, an excellent chance for, for change to happen and to do things differently. So um, let's align values and, and start maybe embracing digital more, if that's a possibility for people to be able to do things digitally. Um, but also it'd be great to, when face-to-face -face meetings are able to start taking place, getting people back out again and getting excited. Uh, uh, that was uh, you know encouraging people to come out and do things and start meeting people face-to-face. I hope that's okay, yeah. my group. Feel free to interject if you'd like. Thanks, Rosalind. I'm, it's all right. I'm trying to kind of like write notes as well. I've as, got as, them all as, here, as, Vaughan, don't you? Oh, worry. you've done them. Okay. <laughs> um, so in uh, my group, we had Laura, Anne Marie, uh, Heather, and uh, Trevelyan. So does anybody want to? Um, we didn't decide this, did we, in our group, which is very bad for us. Um, does, would anyone like to feedback? No takers. Right. <laughs> so, well, again, we had a good mix of kind of, you know, like an independent artist and small groups to a, a building based um, uh, organization with uh, uh, with NAC and also Laura from Sandor Council. So um, it, we, we talked about um, actually the mechanisms and how things work in the corporate sector and the um, and the networking and how do we as the arts and culture sector kind of how do we open that up. Um, and how do we create those networks? And I quite like the the um, the idea of the surgeries. Actually, that might be something that we can take forward because I think then we can try and kind of um, you know get get people together and talking. Um, and uh, also, the question was asked, and Kevin, you might be able to answer this. Actually, up we. Um, I think it was Heather who said, are businesses actually looking for, um, you know, activities to support through their CSR? It, it, you know, are we kind of, are we uh, kind of looking at closed doors or open doors, you know, and I, is that something that we can? I, I think there are many open doors out there. I just think that they need, they need guidance. Mm -hmm. They need to be really encourage to do it but i say make it really easy for them don't don't yeah. really make them have to think too deeply about it Build so even up. in these yeah even in these kind of you know difficult times there'll be budgets set aside and things that are 
that that organizations really want to get involved in you yeah, think i think the the, the, the really encouraging and, and you know i'm talking about our sector is we're seeing a huge increase in demand for employee well-being now to me the, this whole sector really can help with employee well-being and, and that is that that is only going to grow over the coming coming years so i think it's a fantastic opportunity for the sector now to start again, valuing what it has taking pride in what it has be passionate about it which you all are and, and, and getting in there and, and talking to, to organizations make it easy for them okay no that's that's really that's really good um to know um and so does uh, i think other things have been kind of covered by some of the other groups obviously we've probably had similar conversations but does anyone in my group want to add anything else to um to what we said or are you quite happy they're just not they're just not so well um thank you so much for your all your input today i think I feel and I hope this is the, almost the beginning of some conversations um, in the region to try and kind of put our two sectors um, together. So, um, and while I'm chatting, we're, get, we're trying to test out, I think Rosalind um, hopefully has a little poll um, that we can, you can just like, it's, you can just click on it now um while i'm chatting is it is it is that I'm okay af i'm afraid it disappeared again Yvonne. i'm sorry Did it? I don't know oh. it's gone. okay i won't swear loudly um yeah um what we'll do is we'll share the um the the survey we have a, a small survey just so i can see there's some lovely um comments going into the uh into the chat which is brilliant but uh, I know you know you, I know you all know how this works, and we have to report back to our funders. So if you can help us by completing our survey, that would be brilliant. Um, and that's in the chat now. But I also will e email um, everybody um, after, um, and it also helps us keep things relevant and and um, helps us kind of make sure that we're uh, delivering things that you are interested in. Um, so. Uh, Without further ado, I'd like to thank our, um, oh, yes, brilliant. Thank you, Kevin. He's put his email in the chat. And I know Kevin's very, very generous and very open to, um, to people. So if you need advice, have questions, then, you know, please do, do get in touch um, and use, the, use that resource. But I think we will follow this kind of, uh, this theme on and, and hopefully, um, set up some other events or uh, uh, other ways of us being able to tap into this funding source. Um, so I will circulate all of that um, afterwards. So uh, thank you to Rachel from uh, Birmingham 2022. Thank you very much to Kevin for his uh, time and support. And thank you guys for joining us on a lovely sunny day. And I hope that uh, we'll see you again very soon. Thank you.